Well, welcome tonight. Tonight, we're going to ask and answer our question, can a rational person believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Now, parents sat down with their eight-year-old child and they said, listen, son, we need to have a talk. We need to have a talk about the birds and the bees. And the boy stood up and said, no way, sorry, it's not going to happen. First, you sat me down a while ago and you said, we need to have a talk about Santa Claus. And you told me how Santa Claus doesn't exist. And then you sat me down and said, we need to have a a talk about uh, the Easter Bunny. And you told me the Easter Bunny doesn't exist. And then you sat me down and said, we need to have a talk about the Tooth Fairy. And you told me the Tooth Fairy doesn't exist. Now you're going to tell me birds and bees don't exist. I can't handle this. Well, this course is designed for skeptics and for friends of skeptics. It's designed to address nagging questions around issues of God and faith. So let's quickly remind ourselves of the terrain that we traveled so far. Last week, we uh, looked at the evidence for the existence of God. And we said that God is the best explanation for the existence of the universe. We said God is the best for the existence of the fine-tuning of the universe. We said God is the best explanation for the existence of objective moral values and duties. And then we said God is the best explanation for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, last, the last point last week was more of a promissory note for today. Tonight, we're going to complete the final point from last week's presentation, that God is the best explanation explanation for the events surrounding the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, I don't want to assume, what is the resurrection? Some of you may be saying, what does the word resurrection mean? The resurrection of Jesus. Resurrection means that Jesus of Nazareth died, and then, after being placed in a tomb, he rose again from the dead. He was dead, and then he rose again from the dead. That's what we mean by the resurrection. Never to die again. So far, the evidence presented argues for the existence of a morally good, incredibly powerful, unfathomably intelligent creator of the universe who exists eternally outside space and time. That's what we learned last week. But this describes the God of all three of the world's monotheistic religions, God of Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. Tonight's teaching is a turning point. Because tonight's teaching will eliminate two of those, leaving us with only one remaining option. So what is the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ? What can a rational, grounded, facts-based individual be a... Can a a rational, facts-based individual be a proponent of the resurrection hypothesis? So let's look at the historical facts as modern scholarship knows them. Now... Although I am fully committed to the concept that the Bible is God's word to us, for the sake of the presentation this evening, I am not treating the New Testament as a set of inspired, holy scriptures. What I mean is this, I am not giving the New Testament any special treatment this evening. Instead, this evening, I'm going to treat the New Testament documents as modern scholars and historians treat them, as simple ancient historical documents that have been handed down and need to be tested, verified, and scrutinized. Now, many who are unfamiliar with the state of New Testament scholarship have the mistaken impression that the textual reliability of the New Testament documents is suspect. Meaning, a lot of people think and say, and I've heard this over the decades, the Bible's just a dusty old book that's been translated so many times, we don't know what it originally said, it's lost its original meaning. In fact, a lot of people think that the New Testament is like the game of telephone, where, you know, at the beginning of the game of telephone, somebody starts here with an idea, and you've got a whole lineup of people, and this first person whispers in the next person's ear a a paragraph, and then this person has to quickly recite it to the next person, the next person, all the way down the line, this paragraph, and you're trying to remember what has been said to you. And by the time it gets to the end, this person, you know, 15 people down the row, have a completely different statement than what was said originally. And a lot of people say, that That's what the Bible's like. When we have our Bible here, it's really a game of telephone that's just been passed on and and it's been changed over the centuries. In reality, nothing could be further from the truth. 
And let me illustrate with a, a, a fact, that, that fact with a comparison that I've provided for you in your outlines this evening. It's on this uh, whiteboard here as well that'll help us to fill in these blanks. Okay. We have different writings, of course, in history and philosophy and so on. And when history professors quote from the writing of Aristotle, they don't doubt that Aristotle actually wrote those words, and with good reason. So let, let's put down Aristotle here. That's your first blank. The writings of Aristotle, the philosopher. Okay? Now, do we have the original writings that Aristotle wrote? No, of course we don't. He wrote them somewhere between 384 and 322 B.C. So Aristotle wrote his original writing somewhere between 384 and 322 B.C., okay? Do we have the originals? No, they were written on papyrus or whatever. Centuries ago, they've rotted, they've dissolved, they're, they're completely gone. We don't have the originals, and that's not to be expected. Of course we don't. The earliest copy then, so we don't have this original. What is the earliest copy we have? When was it written? The earliest copy we have is from 1100 A.D., meaning B.C., before Christ, A.D., the year of our Lord, so, uh, you know, 1100 years ago. So, we don't have the original, and the earliest copy we have is 1100 A.D., which is a gap of 1400 years. So, the gap between the original, which we've lost, uh, the earliest copy, and, and, the, and uh, what we have now is 1,400 years. It's a long time, but historically speaking, not too bad because we have 49 copies. 49 copies. Now you say, why does that matter? The more copies, the better. Okay? So think in these terms. A um, hundred years from now, they're doing a study on the skeptic course. And they're wondering, what did Darren teach? Because he's such a loser. What did that guy teach during that skeptic course? Well, do we have Darren's original notes? No, we don't. So how can we know what he taught? Well, we have some skeptic notebooks that we found. Archaeologists found them. And uh, we've got one notebook. Okay, well, here's what he taught. Well, we're not sure because we've only got one copy of one skeptic notebook. And how do we know that guy took good notes? Well, actually, we found a second copy of skeptic. So we can compare the two. Okay, that helps. We've got two now, and we can see if they're writing down the identical thing. Or problem, though, what if one says one thing and one says another? How do we know if either's right or neither? Well, we have four more copies. Oh, we've got six copies now. Yeah, okay, that helps us because we can compare between the six. And chances are we're going to see, and this is called textual criticism, we, we can see that um, we can compare the two, and there's a whole science behind this. When historians have 49 copies with a gap of, of 1,400 years, they don't doubt when you study Aristotle in university, the professors are telling you that you can be pretty certain that what you're reading is pretty close, if not identical, to what Aristotle wrote. Okay, let's give another example. There's the Iliad by Homer. Not Homer Simpson, but the other Homer. Okay, the Iliad. Uh, the original that he wrote was in 900 B.C. Do we have the original Iliad by Homer? No, of course we don't. The earliest copy we have is from 400 B.C., which is a gap of some 500 years after the original. 500 years, much closer than Aristotle, okay? Homer's Iliad, the original, do we have it? No, but it was written in 900 B.C. We've lost the original. The earliest copy we have is from the year 400 B.C. That's a gap of 500 years between the original and the earliest copy. But here's why we're absolutely certain, and historians are absolutely certain, when you're reading the Iliad, you're reading what Homer wrote, because we have 643 copies. Wow. 643 copies out there, so we can compare. We can be certain that the Iliad we have today is very close to the Iliad that was written nearly 3,000 years ago. Scholars consider this combination of only 500 years gap and 643 copies to be historical bedrock. Okay, now let's look at the New Testament. 
The New Testament, that's the Gospels and the, uh, the, the letters in the New Testament of the Bible. Let's make sure we understand what the Bible is. <clears throat> when you have a Bible, <clears throat> you have the Old Testament and the New Testament. We're talking today about the New Testament. The Bible isn't just one book. It's a book which compiles a bunch of different books together under the same cover. And when we have the New Testament, we have the documents that were written about the life of Jesus of Nazareth and his followers, letters that they wrote after Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. They've been compiled together called the New Testament, literally meaning the new covenant, the new contract that God has made through Jesus. And we compile them together as the New Testament. And that's what we're talking about this evening, because it's the New Testament that talks about Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. Okay, the New Testament documents were written sometime between 45 and 95 AD. Okay, so the New Testament was written sometime, all the documents between 45 and 95 AD, scholars tell us. The earliest copies we have are between 120, 125, Darren, you can write better than that, 125 and 200 AD. That is a gap of 150 years, conservatively, 150 years. Not 1,100 years, or not 1,400 years, I should say, not 500 years, 150 years, okay? How many copies do we have of the New Testament? Well, this is what gets fascinating. We have between 5,900 and 24,000 copies. You say, why such a huge gap? Well, because it depends on the language you're talking about. Ancient Greek, we have 5,856 copies, and they're still finding copies all over the world. 5,800 ancient Greek, and it was originally written in ancient Greek, but then we have another 23,986 copies in Syrian, Latin, Coptic, and Aramaic. So we have up to 24,000 copies to compare. Ladies and gentlemen, in comparison to all ancient writings that historians have no doubt about, you can see the New Testament rises above them all. Now, here's the thing. The simple truth is the New Testament is the best attested document in ancient history, both in terms of the number of manuscripts and in the nearness of the copies to the originals. In fact, modern reconstructions of the New Testament text have been done, and it has now been firmly established by scholars and historians that 98.9% .9 of the New Testament is accurate to the original documents. Meaning, with text, the science of textual criticism, they're able to compare, and with the ancient documents, compare what we have, and there's a 98.9% .9 certainty. So, despite the uninformed ranting of the odd internet infidel blogger, when we deal with the claims around the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, we're not playing a game of telephone where rumors have grown over the centuries. No, we are dealing with, with, with literally historical facts. In fact, let me give you another stat. There are 138,000 words in the, in the New Testament, Greek words. Of those 138,000, we are absolutely certain, I want to get this right, 134,600, I believe. Absolute certainty, uh, no, 136.6, 136.4, I should say, 136,400, no, 136.6. Can you tell I'm a numbers guy? 138,000 Greek words in the New Testament. We are absolutely certain of 136,600 of them. There's only roughly 1,400, less than 1,400 words that we're not certain of. And of those 1,400 words we're not certain of, none of them have any um, significance in the sense of there's nothing to do with a doctrine or a history. It's things like, does the, does the, did Paul say that your joy may be full or that our joy may be full? We're not certain. In fact, if you read your New Testament, you see at the bottom there's these little notes. Some manuscripts say this, some manuscripts say that. There is no doubt we know where there's some different renderings, and uh, they'll, your Bibles will tell you what the majority of the renderings say. We have absolute 
certainty for all intents and purposes of what you're reading when you're reading the New Testament. Sir Frederick Kenyon, once the director and principal librarian of the British Museum, he wrote this, any doubts that the scriptures have come down to us substantially as they were written has now been removed. Both the authenticity and the general integrity of the books of the New Testament may be regarded as finally established. Remember Dr. Anthony Flew? He was the famous atheist that uh, became a theist. Never became a Christ follower that I'm aware of, but he certainly became a theist. He stated this during a debate while he was still an atheist. He stated this, the textual authority, the earliness and number of manuscripts for most of the Christian documents is unusually great. So, despite the rantings of some internet infidels out there, we're not playing a game of telephone where rumors have grown over the centuries. We're dealing with claims that can be traced literally to first century contemporaries and even eyewitnesses. Now, historians reached a consensus long ago regarding the existence of Jesus. The 19th and early 20th century proposition that the, the man named Jesus was just a legend was long ago put to bed by modern scholarship and archaeology. If you are thinking or have been told, we don't even know if Jesus existed, anyone who says that to you literally does not know what they're talking about. They are not familiar at all with modern scholarship. This is not an issue. I remember years ago, I, um, I'm from Ontario originally, and I was at the Ontario Royal Ontario Museum. The Dead Sea Scrolls uh, were visiting uh, portions of them, and I was at the presentation of the Dead Sea Scrolls from Israel. And some, a Jewish professor was there traveling with the scrolls, and there was a room of about two, 300 people, maybe about these many people, uh, at the Royal Ontario Museum, and uh, he was answering questions. And I'll never forget, a woman at the back went to the microphone, or she shouted out. She said, yes, you keep talking about this Jesus as though he existed. We don't even know if he existed. And I'll never forget what that Jewish professor said. He said, ma'am, uh, you're wrong. He said, we have no doubt, archaeologically, historically, that Jesus of Nazareth lived and existed in, that, in the first century. He said, that, that's not an issue. That's not debated. It's a fact of history. Dr. Edwin Yamochi of Miami University, a leading expert in ancient history, stated the following, I quote, We have better historical documentation for Jesus than for the founder of any other ancient religion. So if someone tells you that they, we don't even know if Jesus of Nazareth ever existed, they are uninformed and ignorant of modern scholarship. I've discovered that while many people understand that the existence of Jesus is a historical fact, they mistakenly think that the resurrection of Jesus is something you just have to believe by a leap of faith. That's not true. The resurrection of Jesus is equally a matter of dealing with historical evidence. Now, when it comes to the historical uh, record, there are essentially four established facts recognized by the vast majority of New Testament scholars, critics, and historians today, which I would put to you are best explained by the resurrection of Jesus. Now remember, these four facts I'm about to present are not in dispute amongst the vast majority of modern scholars and critics, meaning agnostic and atheistic scholars and critics as well. These four facts are not debated. These four facts are agreed upon even by those who deny or doubt that Jesus rose from the dead. They still agree on these four facts we're about to share. So tonight, I want us to think of ourselves as detectives. And these four facts are four concrete clues that we have to work with to make a decision. So here we go. Historical fact number one in your outline. After his crucifixion, Jesus was buried in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. After his crucifixion, meaning Jesus was killed on a cross, he died. After he died, his crucifixion, Jesus was buried in the tomb of a man named Joseph of Arimathea. Joseph of Arimathea was a member of the Jewish Sanhedrin, which is an ancient Jewish court in Jerusalem. It was the court that, that sentenced Jesus to death. They didn't have the authority to carry it out. Only Romans could do that. But they sentenced Jesus to death and convinced the Romans to have Jesus crucified. Now, the ancient documents declare that after Jesus' death, his body was wrapped and then buried in the tomb. 
that was donated by a member of the Sanhedrin. Think about this. We know the name of the guy who donated the tomb. Historians find this fact to be highly credible due to what they refer to as the embarrassment factor. By that they mean it's highly unlikely that this is a later legendary embellishment since you have one of the enemies of the early church, a member of the judicial body that had Jesus killed, acting in a heroic manner. Joseph of Arimathea, a member of the Sanhedrin that sentenced Jesus to death. He's the one who donated the tomb. The early Christians would not invent that. Early Christians inventing the story of Joseph of Arimathea burying Jesus would be like modern Israel inventing a story of Hitler secretly rescuing Jewish children from concentration camps. It wouldn't happen. For this, among other reasons, historians agree after his crucifixion, Jesus was buried in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. Secondly, historical fact number two in your outline. On the Sunday following his death, the tomb of Jesus Christ was found to be empty by his woman followers. On the Sunday following his death, the tomb of Jesus was found to be empty by his women followers. The empty tomb is a fact of history. Realize this. Historians will debate how the tomb became empty, but they don't debate if the tomb was empty. The fact that the tomb was found empty by a group of women serves as another powerful sign of authenticity to ancient historians, again, due to the embarrassment factor. Now, you say, Darren, why was this embarrassing? Don't shoot the messenger here. I'm just telling you the facts, okay? As distasteful as it is to our modern sensibilities, the testimony of women was not acceptable in Jewish courts. Women were simply not trusted as reliable witnesses. An invented account of the circumstances surrounding the empty tomb would certainly not have the first witnesses be women. An invented account would have Peter or John or, or some other powerful group of men be the first eyewitnesses. But the fact that the manuscripts record that it was women who first witnessed the empty tomb and saw the resurrected Jesus is a strong sign of unvarnished, honest testimony. Historical fact number three. On separate, multiple occasions... Different individuals and groups of individuals, including 500 people at one time, saw what they claimed to be appearances of Jesus. And you could re actually remove what they claimed. It's actually saw appearances of Jesus alive after his death. On separate multiple occasions, different individuals and groups of individuals, including 500 people at one time, saw appearances of Jesus alive after his death. Now, folks, these appearances were witnessed not just by believers, but by unbelievers, skeptics, and even enemies of Christ. By the way, Christ means Messiah, Savior. So this is an important fact because any appeal to hallucinations or wish fulfillment simply does not fit the historical facts. As, so, in other words, some people say, well, you know, these were just hallucinations, and we'll get to this in a moment as a theory, but this, this theory that it was just wish fulfillment, they so wanted him to be alive that they just made it up in their minds and saw him. Well, as one example, the undeniable facts behind the story of the man known as Saul of Tarsus is a crucial piece of history that has to be addressed. Saul was a Jewish religious scholar and by his own account, a zealot who was an enemy of the early Christ followers. In fact, Saul terrorized the early church. He hunted down and he killed the first Christians. It's a fact of history. While on one of his seek and destroy missions, Saul claimed to have had an encounter with the resurrected Jesus. This encounter instantly changed the direction of Saul's life. In literally an instant, Saul turned from being a killer of Christians to being a follower of Christ in an instant. This would be akin to Osama bin Laden being leader of Al-Qaeda at 11 a.m. and being a member of President Bush's cabinet at 11.01 a.m. That's how 
radical this was. Now, historians marvel. What could cause such a powerful, radical, instant turnaround? Saul claimed he met the resurrected Christ, and he would later die because of that claim. Scholars are in agreement that the historical record reports multiple early independent eyewitness accounts. And these multiple early independent testimonies, even eyewitness testimony from enemies and combatants, must be accounted for. Historical fact number four. The original disciples suddenly came to believe in the resurrection of Jesus despite having no expectation of it. The original disciples suddenly came to believe in the resurrection of Jesus despite having no expectation of it. As one scholar put it, he said, you need to have a sufficient launching pad to explain the launch of this missile called Christianity. It can't be a gradual ramp of legend being built up over decades or generations. It was an instant liftoff. Men and women who were one day hiding and cowering and denying that they even knew Christ were the next day willing to die for the claim that they had seen the risen Christ. Something happened literally in an instant that must be explained. Now, It's important to understand that the original disciples had absolutely no expectation of a dying and rising Messiah. When we think Messiah, we think, yeah, someone who dies for the people and rises from the dead. That's not at all the concept, the Jewish concept of Messiah. Still isn't to this day. The Messiah was a political leader. He was a hero. He was going to come. He was going to defeat those dirty Romans, and he was going to rescue Israel and restore them to their previous glory. The Messiah doesn't die. The Messiah dying would be like Superman dying. It's unthinkable. It's impossible. It's an oxymoron, a dying Messiah. Add to that the fact that according to Jewish law, Jesus' method of death, how he died, was considered evidence that he was under God's curse, not that he was a Messiah. Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, Scripture says in the Old Testament. Plus, add to that the fact that Jewish beliefs in the afterlife did not anticipate anyone being resurrected until the very end of the world. And when you combine all that together, you realize that the resurrection of Jesus was a completely unanticipated event. When Jesus died, they weren't sitting around waiting for him to rise from the dead. It just wasn't as part of their thinking at all. It wasn't in the Jewish mindset. Scholar Dr. N.T. Wright put it this way, I quote him, In the first century, when your Messiah died, you either went home or you went and got yourself a new Messiah. Now, If we want to be rational, we need to deal with the facts. When you're rational, facts are your friends. So what are the facts of this case? Here's what we know. And again, this is not disputed, folks. Historical fact number one, after his crucifixion, Jesus was buried in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. Historical fact number two, on the Sunday following his death, the tomb of Jesus was found to be empty by his women followers. Historical fact number three, on separate multiple occasions, different individuals and groups of individuals, including 500 people at one time, saw appearances of Jesus alive after his death. Historical fact number four, the original disciples suddenly came to believe in the resurrection of Jesus, despite having no expectation of it. Now, as honest detectives, as men and women who are willing to follow wherever the evidence leads, our explanation needs to account for all four of these historical facts. Now, here's the thing. Every naturalistic attempt over the last 2,000 years to explain these historical facts has been universally rejected by contemporary scholarship. Understand this, and this is an area I've devoted over 40, 45 years of my life studying. There is not one single naturalistic theory that is able to explain all the known facts of the case. Not one. But don't take my word for it. Let me show you. So what are the competing theories to the eyewitness claims of Jesus' followers? 
What rational alternatives has 2,000 years worth of skepticism produced? Here is the product of 2,000 years worth of skepticism. Number one is what we'll call the theft theory. It's referred to as the theft theory. This is the theory that says that the disciples came and stole the body. This was the very first theory that was proposed by the Jewish authorities at that time. So the claim was, so, so Jesus' body is placed in the tomb. It's, there's a giant stone rolled in front of the tomb. So he wasn't buried in the ground. It was a tomb on the side of like a side of a mountain carved in. And a giant stone is pull, put into a, a slot in the ground. So it, it takes a couple men to open it. It's sealed. And then some Roman guards are placed outside that tomb. And the original theory was this. The, the, uh, the authority said, here's what you need to say. The guards tell people, while you were sleeping, the disciples came and stole the body. Now, you don't have to be Columbo to figure this one out. I want everybody right now, and, and trust me with this, everyone right now, s place your eyes in the position they would be while you were asleep. So everyone right now, just trust me, right now, you can still be sitting up when you do it, but if you sleep with your eyes wide open, then stay with your eyes wide open. But if you sleep with your eyes closed, do that right now, please. Okay? Just trust me. Keep your eyes at sleeping position. How many fingers am I holding up? Okay, if you said five, that means you're not sleeping. Exactly. You sleep with your eyes closed. So let's go back to the first theory. While we were asleep... The disciples came and stole the body. You were asleep. How do you know what happened? How do you know they did this? Lots of problems. By the way, when you say the disciples, do you mean those same guys who hid when Jesus was arrested, shrank from a woman's accusations around a campfire, and were too afraid to even claim Jesus' body? These guys suddenly conspired together to steal his body and to make up a resurrection story? Does that make sense? How can sleeping guards identify people? And by the way, guards who fell asleep in first century Roman guards, if you fell asleep on the job, you would be killed. They weren't killed. There's no record that these men were killed. And what about the resurrection appearances, including to enemies of Jesus? That doesn't explain. You know, if his body's been, sold, uh, been stolen, what about the resurrection appearances, including to people who hated Jesus? And does an outright lie explain the disciples' lives from that day forward? Not all, but many of them died for a known lie. They knew they stole the body, they hid it somewhere, and then they walked around saying, Jesus has risen from the dead. And what did they get for this? Did they go on Oprah? Did they go on a book tour? No. Many of them lost their lives for something they knew was a lie. Does that make sense to you? What did they gain other than eternity if it was true? That's why the theft theory has not been proposed as a viable alternative for 2,000 years now. So let's go to the second one. The no burial theory. The no burial theory. And this is the theory that says the body was thrown into a pit, not the tomb. So these people say, oh, so what happened was... You know, the Romans killed thousands, tens of thousands of people all the time, crucified them. And what they did was they didn't all give them decent burials. They had often throw them in just a pit. And that's what happened. Jesus' body, they said, was thrown into a pit, not into the tomb. The woman went and looked in the tomb, and they were mistaken. They saw the tomb was empty. They thought he was placed in the tomb. He wasn't. He was thrown in a pit with other criminals. What's the problem with this theory? It's real simple. As soon as the disciples started to go out through Jerusalem and proclaim that Jesus has been raised from the dead, all the Romans had to do was say, oh, time out, you're mistaken. Open up the pit there, show them the body. Now, see, there he is, look down there, there he is. He's not raised from the dead. All they had to do was produce the real body. And what about the resurrection appearances? This doesn't explain the resurrection appearances. This theory has never had serious consideration and has absolutely no modern-day support as a viable alternative. What about number three? The wrong tomb theory. The wrong tomb theory. The women, and I'm sorry, you know, women in directions. The women accidentally went to the wrong tomb on Easter morning. 
So, you know, so it's Easter morning. They go to the, the cemetery where there's different tombs, and they run, and they turn to the right, and they look, and there's a tomb that's empty. He's alive! When really he was buried over this one. They went to the wrong tomb. So the wrong tomb theory. What are the problems with this theory? Why wouldn't the Romans kindly point them to the right tomb? No, ladies, you made a mistake. You looked in the wrong tomb. Here, Claudius, roll away the stone. See, there he is. He's in there. And what about the resurrection appearances? This theory never got any traction, has no modern-day support as a viable alternative. Number four, the hallucination theory. The hallucination theory. This is the theory that says the resurrection appearances were mere hallucinations. The disciples were so grief-stricken. They so were devastated. They thought he was the Messiah, and now he's been killed, and he's been laid in a tomb, and they just can't fathom it. They were wrong all along. How could they have been fooled? They're so blown away. They so want him to be alive that they imagine it. They hallucinate it. What are the problems with this theory? Well, there's several. Why wouldn't the Romans produce the body and end all this hallucinating? You're hallucinating, folks. Claudius, roll the stone away. There he is. See, he's dead. Plus, this theory doesn't fit the facts for Jesus' appearances to the disciples as a group or to a crowd of 500. He appeared to all of them as a group a couple times and to a crowd of 500 at one time. See, here's the thing with hallucinations. I can have a hallucination, you can have a hallucination, but we can't network our hallucinations. Hallucinations are like dreams. I can dream, you can dream, but, you know, I heard one person say just today, I was listening to a, a, a podcast, and the, the uh, scholar talked about, he said, you know, he says, I can say to my wife, listen, I'm having a really good dream about Hawaii. You go to sleep and dream with me, and we can have a vacation together in our dreams. It doesn't work like that. And hallucinations don't work like that. Plus, preconditioning is a major factor in hallucinations. This theory doesn't fit the facts regarding the state of mind of the disciples. James, who was Jesus' brother, he was not a follower of Jesus when Jesus walked the earth. In fact, James said at one point, Jesus is crazy. He thought he was crazy. Who is he, the Messiah? What's going on? So when Jesus died, James wasn't a follower, but it was only after Jesus made a resurrection appearance to James that James became a follower of Jesus, leader of the church of Jerusalem, and eventually was martyred for his faith. Or what about Saul, who became the Apostle Paul and wrote much of the New Testament? Saul was someone who terrorized and killed Christians. He wasn't having wish fulfillment. He was glad Jesus was dead. It doesn't fit the facts. And by the way, when one person has, a, when you have a hallucination involving a deceased person, you don't take that hallucination as a sign that that person is alive, but as confirmation the person's dead. This theory was proposed in the early 20th century. However, I'm not aware of any modern day evidence among New Testament historians and scholars who support it today. Number five, the swoon theory. The swoon theory. This is the theory that some Muslims hold, uh, which is Jesus only fainted on the cross. He resuscitated in the cool tomb and he escaped. So, so get this. This theory goes like this. Jesus is hanging on the cross. And while he's on the cross, he, he swoons, he faints, he goes into a coma. People think he's dead, but he's not. They take him down, they place him in the tomb, seal the tomb, and the coolness of the tomb and the spices that they wrapped him with revive him. And he wakes up, he exits the tomb, and then he appears to his followers and says, I'm alive. You're raised from the dead. That's the swoon theory. So what are the problems with this theory? They are multiple. Death by on the cross was essentially death by asphyxiation. So you're hanging on a cross, nailed, and your feet are nailed, your, your hands are nailed. And what you would do is you would push up on your feet because it's hard to breathe because you're hanging like this. So you'd push up 
try to get a couple of breaths and then you're exhausted, you hang down, you're suffocating, you push up, down, up, down, up, down. You do that for hours. That's why if they're trying to hurry the process, they would break their legs. So you couldn't push up anymore and you would asphyxiate quicker. Suffocation is when you have something on the outside uh, stopping your breath. Asphyxiation is when you die from, the, from within. You die of asphyxiation. And so, Jesus is there hanging. What they do is, they don't break his legs. The Roman soldiers, whose profession it was to kill people, they killed thousands. This was their job. They know when someone's dead. They saw that he was dead, so they didn't have to break his legs. But to make sure, they stuck a spear in his side and out poured blood and water, which is a sign of a, 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 a broken, literally a, a vessel, a, a heart. And... And he didn't flinch or anything. He was dead. So they took him down, and he was then wrapped and placed in a tomb. But get this. Jesus was beaten before he was killed with 39 lashes with a whip, with a a cat of nine tails, it's called, where on the end of the whip, there's pieces of bone attached to it. So when the whip would grab the back, it would grab it and tear flesh from it. And they, they did it 39 times because the Romans had estimated that's just enough to not kill the person. So he's whipped 39 times, carries a wooden cross through the city, nailed to it, hung there for six hours, was stabbed in the side of his chest to ensure he was dead. Water and blood flowed out, pericardium aorta pierced is what that signified. After a physical examination, Jesus was pronounced dead by the authorities whose profession it was to kill people. And if you took somebody down from the cross before they were dead, you would be killed. Could have, so he's placed in this tomb behind this massive stone. Now, here's the question. If this swoon theory is right, could a crucified man unwrap himself, like he's wrapped in cloth, like a mummy, could he unwrap himself, single-handedly move away the stone from the inside with his whipped back, his pierced legs, feet, and hands, push the stone all by himself from inside the tomb, sneak past the guards, appear to his disciple in his beaten, emaciated body and say, I've been raised from the dead and you too can have a body like this someday. (laughs) Inspire them, leave, never to be seen again. I am not aware of any contemporary historians or New Testament scholars that subscribe to that theory. That's it. That is the state of the... Well, actually, no, there's one more. I didn't put it on your outline. There's one more. This is state of the art. You can write this somewhere on your side notes. Dr. William Lane Craig uh, talks about this. He's a, probably the world's foremost Christian apologist and debater. He's actually spoken here at Broadway a few years ago. He shared once about a debate that on this topic, a debate he had with a professor from the University of California a professor who did his doctoral thesis on a skeptical response to the resurrection. Here's the state of the art. (gasps) Jesus had an unknown twin brother who was not raised with Jesus. And he just happened to be in the Jerusalem area during this time of Jesus' trial and crucifixion. He appeared and people thought it was Jesus. That's it. That's state of the art. Say, there's another theory that Muslims believe, but it's not. It's not a naturalistic one. The other theory, it's actually right out of the Quran, Um, Surah two or three, um, Surah four, one fifty seven, one fifty eight. It says in the Quran, they did not kill him, neither did they crucify him. It only appeared to be so. So the Quran actually teaches that Jesus didn't die. And there's different theories from the Quran. One is that that God put a Jesus impersonator on the cross. So Allah takes Jesus up to heaven and puts a Jesus impersonator on the cross. And that's who was crucified. Now, so Jesus himself wasn't killed. The problem that Muslims have with this is this. The one thing that everybody in historically agrees on, atheists, agnostics, religious people, that they all agree on, one historical fact is Jesus died. 
And that's the one thing the Quran says, no, it didn't happen. They didn't kill him, nor did they crucify him. That's the one thing everybody historically says, no, that we know that happened. Plus, the problem with this, that you then have Allah as the source of the greatest lie placed on humanity. All these two billion followers of Jesus are believing a lie because Allah tricked us. What, what, what's, what, what was the point of that trick? He's a great deceiver. He made us think Jesus rose from the dead. Why? Doesn't make sense. But that's, those are your options. So here's the f- conclusion, folks. I would respectfully put to you that a rational person can accept the resurrection of Jesus. If by rational, you mean dealing with the facts and following wherever the evidence leads you. The only explanation that factors in all of the known historical facts is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's why it seems to me the follower of Jesus is historically and intellectually justified in both believing and declaring that Jesus rose from the dead, proving that he is who he claimed to be. God come to earth in flesh. Years, many years ago, Professor Thomas Arnold, scholar, author of the famous three-volume History of Rome, appointed to the chair of modern history at Oxford University, a man well acquainted with the value of evidence in determining historical facts, wrote this concerning the historical evidence for the resurrection of Jesus. I conclude with this quote. He said, thousands and thousands of persons have gone through it piece by piece, as carefully as every judge summing up on a most important cause. I myself have done it many times over, not to persuade others, but to satisfy myself. I have been used for many years to study the histories of other times and to examine and weigh the evidence of those who have written about them. And I know of no one fact in the history of mankind which is proved by better and fuller evidence of every sort of the understanding of a fair inquirer than the great sign which God has given us that Christ died and rose again from the dead. So what's the most plausible response to the facts in your mind when it comes to evidence for the existence of God, when it comes to evidence for the resurrection of Jesus? What better answer do you have than what we've discussed for the last two weeks? Talk about this around your table, and then we'll open it up for questions and answers. Now, um, there, there is extra biblical, extra biblical meaning sources outside of the Bible. But let's, let me challenge the premise for a second uh, of that, if, if you think about it. People say, um, are, there, are there documents other than eyewitness documents? No other aspect of history would we ask that question. It's like, you know... Um, there's a research done on the Hillary Clinton, Donald Trump campaign in 2016. And uh, I want to hear some evidence uh, what happened on the buses, uh, each campaign bus. But I don't want evidence from people who are actually on the bus. I prefer evidence from people who lived 100 years later who weren't alive at the time. I will trust that more. Does, does that make sense to you? But that's what essentially people are asking for. When they ask, for the most part, for biblical, extra-biblical evidence, they're saying, I don't want eyewitness accounts, which is what the Gospels are, and the New Testament epistles are. Those are eyewitness accounts. And we know that uh, at least seven of Paul's, what, 14 epistles, or 16 epistles, 14, I can't remember off the top of my head, there's no doubt that he wrote them. Okay, so we, and the Gospels, they're not denied by historians that these are, um, if they're not eyewitness accounts, they're based on eyewitness accounts, okay? But having said that, uh, within 100 uh, to 150 years um, after Christ's birth, uh, approximately 18 non-Christian secular historical sources mention more than 100 facts about the beliefs, teachings, and life of Jesus in early Christendom. Let me give you some examples. Um, Josephus is a Roman historian, not a Christ follower. Uh, He mentioned Jesus in Antiquities, his writing, 93 AD. 
Um, this was once looked at, a quote that was uh, fabricated by Christians later, but uh, that's no longer felt. They've actually, there was an Arabic version that was discovered, uh, which didn't have the, the sort of the flowery language. Suffice it to say, it's, it's been studied, and it's really no longer denied that this was a quote from Josephus. Here's what he wrote. Again, this is a Jewish historian. He was a Jew who's a Roman historian, and uh, he wrote this. At this time, there appeared Jesus, a wise man, for he was the doer of startling deeds, a teacher of people who received the truth with pleasure. And he gained a following among Jews, many Jews, and among many of Gentile origin. And when Pilate, because of an accusation made by the leading men among us, condemned him to the cross, those who had loved him previously did not cease to do so. And up until this day, the tribe of Christians named after him have not died out. Pliny the Younger, uh, A.D. 61 to 112. He was a lawyer, a famous Christian hater. He despised Christians. He was a Christian hunter. He wrote hundreds of letters. We have many of them. In one letter, he described his hatred for first century Christians. Here's a direct quote from his letter. They were, speaking of Christians, they were accustomed to meet on a fixed day before dawn and sing responsively a hymn to Christ as to a God and bound themselves to a solemn oath not to do any wicked deeds, but never to commit any fraud, theft, adultery, never to falsify their word, not to deny a trust when they should be called upon to deliver it up. Tacitus, written in Annals in A.D. 116, reporting to, uh, about Emperor Nero's decision to blame the Christians for the fire that engulfed Rome in uh, A.D. 64, Tacitus wrote this, Nero fastened the guilt on a class hated for their abominations called Christians by the populace. Christus, from whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of Pontius Pilate, and a most mischievous superstition, thus checked for the moment, again broke out not only in Judea, the first source of the evil, but even in Rome. And there are others, but those are some main ones. And for there to be any mention of Jesus at all in ancient Roman documentation is remarkable. When you consider that he was just a Jewish criminal crucified in a backwater world of ancient Palestine, why would he make it on the Roman radar of a Roman historian is a clear sign that something remarkable happened through his life, okay? Dr. N.T. Wright, at the end of his massive study on the resurrection, he states that the empty tomb and appearances have a historical probability which is so high as to be, I quote him, virtually virtually certain, like the death of Augustus in AD 14 and the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70. So there you go. But I didn't set this question up, right? <laughs> I didn't. I just bought this book. It just It's the state of the art. I am just started to read it. It's author Gary Haber, who actually spoke here at Broadway a few years ago. He is probably the, one of the preeminent uh, uh, scholars in this subject. This is his book, On the Resurrection, Volume 1, Evidences. This is 1,000 pages. This is just on the evidence for four, what he calls minimum facts, four undenied facts about the resurrection of Jesus. And uh, he has another book, which I've pre-ordered, is coming out this fall, another thousand pages, dealing with just with the skeptical responses. And so there's a great book on the resurrection. Also, uh, Dr. Lacona is a great source as well. Um, Anything from Dr. William Lane Craig uh, would be excellent. So I would say Gary Habermas, Dr. Mike Lycona, L-I-C-O-N-A, and um, Dr. N.T. Wright wrote a massive volume like this big on the resurrection. You go to those sources and you are going to bedrock of scholarship, okay? That was what the ascension was all about. Jesus resurrected, he made appearances for a a couple weeks, few weeks, and then he ascended as a way of communicating to the disciples, don't be looking for me around the next corner or whatever. Um, 
that Jesus said to Thomas, who doubted, you know, you know, you you believe because you see, but blessed are those who believe without seeing. So he has given us enough evidences uh, in in history and uh, in his personal spirit-to-spirit interaction with us that it's not necessary to to have uh, physical appearances. But think about this, though. Uh, What's his name? Uh, God delusion. Dawkins. I saw an interview with him once, and he said, he was asked, you know, what would it take for you to believe in God and the resurrection and so on? And he actually acknowledged, he said, they said, what if, you know, the set in the sky, Jesus is alive? Or what if every molecule had made by God on it? Um, He said himself, if that stuff appeared, I would believe I was hallucinating. Essentially, what he acknowledges, there is no evidence that would, that would prove it. So if he appeared to people and they were so skeptical, they'd say, oh, I, it was a hallucination. I had pizza last night and I thought Jesus appeared to me. It's crazy. I mean, the Pharisees who uh, Jesus appeared to, um, keep in mind, the, 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 the priests and so on, they, he rose from the dead. And what did they do? They said to the guards, okay, here's what you say. Say that, and let's make up a story. Say that the disciples came and stole the body. Here, we'll pay you some money, and we'll be good with that. We'll make sure that, that uh, you know, Pilate doesn't kill you. They knew he had raised from the dead, had risen from the dead. They saw his miracles, and they refused to believe because it upset their political power. So if a person's heart is not open, no amount of evidence is going to change. So we have multiple independent attestation. So it's just not one person who's fabricating a story. This is um, evidence within the New Testament and obviously from these, from these other uh, non-biblical, extra-biblical sources as well, all saying the same thing. So it would be like, you're a Canucks fan. I sense it from you. Um, it would be like, you were at game seven in 2011 when the Bruins beat the Canucks and you and 20,000 other people saw it and, and so you come and you testify that the Canucks lost that heartbreaking of a game and we say, well, how do we know you're just not a Bruin fan making that up just to harm us? No, there's so many witnesses to that. It's undeniable. It's, it's highly attested. And it's like that with the New Testament with the resurrection of Jesus. It's been attested to, it was attested to by multiple independent individuals, skeptics, believers, enemies of Jesus. So it's not a matter of somebody making something up and then everyone believing it. Many people, hundreds of people, um, witnessed it and testified to it. So with the 500 people, the Apostle Paul mentions this in his letter to the Corinthians, and he actually does offer them as witnesses because he said many of them are still alive. So what he was saying was he was listening, he was listing eyewitnesses who were still alive, and he said, and to 500 people at one time, many of whom are still alive. So he was saying, go, ask them yourselves. Um, so they, if they weren't followers before, they certainly would have been, well, we can't guarantee it, they would have been afterwards, but the implication is they were followers that he appeared to. Um, uh, and as far as the other things, are, are you talking about the, the, the legend or whatever that some people appeared on the day Jesus was crucified? Um, if, because, well, that, that's a fact that tombs were opened. Uh, it yeah, talks about yeah. that in the text. Do we have any, if at all, um, evidence from external sources to eliminate the possibility of bias that Right. that that uh, the that event occurred because I think that would carry a lot of weight and you know it would be like yeah. take that look at well, all the evidence <laughs> yeah. we have from all these non-Christians you know what yeah. now atheist yeah um do we have that because I don't well I stumble across, the, the, uh, across any I don't if people wouldn't believe the resurrection they're not going to believe two or three people walking around Jerusalem um truth be told and that those references that's a much debated passage um, and scholars don't know, is that apocalyptic language? Is that literal? There's debate on that, and I don't know where I fall in that, to be honest with you. But uh, I come back to what Jesus said, you know, uh, in a parable once, you know, oh, please, you know, 
brother Abraham, uh, send somebody from the grave to, to, to tell, warn my brother. And they said, no, if you know, they have Moses and the prophets, let them listen to them. But if someone comes from the dead, he says, no, listen, if they won't read, believe scripture, even if someone was to rise from the dead, they won't believe. So if a person is determined to not believe, they're not going to follow where the evidence leads. Oh uh, yeah, he he uh, he he foreshadowed that a few times, but scripture's clear they it went over their heads because it didn't compute. They, they they didn't think he was being literal. He said, you know, the son of man will will die and will arise uh, again. Uh he said uh at the uh famously in the Gospel of John, uh in fact I'm teaching it I think this Sunday here, where he talked about, you know, he said to the uh religious authorities, uh they said, when he turned over the temples in the, or the tables in the temple, they said, what, what authority do you have to do this? What sign can you give that you can do this? He said, destroy this temple and I'll raise it in three days. Um, now, they thought he meant the physical temple. But then his disciples, John writes, later we realized, no, he was speaking of his body. So he was foreshadowing continually. But it didn't compute until afterwards, because they had no concept of the Messiah dying. So they didn't think he was talking about himself. Um, three days, yeah, they could count days back then, just like weekend now. And so uh, there's, that's not disputed, not debated, not discussed. A Friday to Sunday, uh, by the Jewish calendar, any part of one day is a full day. And uh, so uh, that's never debated, discussed, dismissed. And even the Jewish authorities remembered it, because that's why they put a guard there, because they remembered that he had predicted that that might happen. Yes. By the way, which is the context, that's important, the context of his resurrection was, it didn't just happen out of nowhere. It validated his claims. So it didn't happen in a vacuum. He said, I am the Messiah, I will prove it, here's how I'll prove it. So it vindicated his claims to deity. Yes, go ahead. The Quran, there's a huge debate going on in Quranic scholarship right now. Uh, I've been following it. And uh, they, uh, there's a famous statement that the key Yale-trained Islamic scholar said, and he got busted. It's all over YouTube, but he talked about how the, the, uh, the classical narrative has holes in it, he said. Meaning, the theory that we've always taught people that the Quran, there's only one version and it's the same everywhere, that's not true. It's demonstrably not true. And so there's an implosion happening within Quranic scholarship. So um, you, there is really no comparison uh, between the New Testament and the Quran. Um, I know uh, Islamic uh, individuals that I talk about, they, they, it's... They often say that, you know, the New Testament has been corrupted and the original New Testament that was back, you know, in the 500s and 400s before Muhammad, that's, it's been corrupted and uh, it, so it's, you can't trust what we have now today. That's just scholarly, historically, demonstrably false. And, um, and that's, I've seen debates between Muslim scholars and, and Christian apologists and it's, it's quite demonstrably false. Um, so, the Quran and the New Testament, there's really no comparison when it comes to scriptural authenticity or, or historical authenticity, um, uh, as far as that goes. And when it comes to the numbers of manuscripts, that's just a matter of, of record. Anybody could Google that, you know, the number of manuscripts in the Bible, and we're constantly finding new ones. So, the numbers I gave you are dated. I'm sure they're, they're, they're not smaller. They would be larger today, I'm sure. But anybody can understand that concept if you can simply explain to them the original the uh, you know the num the gap between the original and the number of copies and um, it's it's easy to understand so I th those numbers are dependable that I've shared with you let me put it that way yeah. Um, why God chose that route, I don't know, other than it was um, prophesied that he'd be buried in a rich man's tomb, if I'm not mistaken, um, a borrowed tomb. 
But so it's just historically pointing out that, you know, yeah, this, it was the first time this tomb had been used. Um, he didn't need it for very long. So, um, so it was just one of those historical facts, tidbits, that, that speak of historical veracity. It's not just any tomb. No, we know the name of the person who owned that tomb historically. So it just, again, and keep in mind that was a document 2,000 years old. So people who originally read that in the Gospels would know, they would know relatives of Joseph of Arimathea. Again, it was a way to verify and validate it. Uh, by naming names of people and relatives, it was a way of tying it down in the Jerusalem community. It just proved the historicity of it all. But you were saying that he's one of the ones that sent Jesus to the cross. So. Yeah, but it, he appeared to be a secret believer. Some of the Sanhedrists were actually, uh, we read, actually became, and the chief priests be, and priests became followers of Jesus, but they hid it initially because of the persecution they would experience. Keep in mind, when we say, if God is love, why would he do this to Jesus? Jesus is God. So it's not as though, you know, I, I have children. It's not as though I made one of my kids do this on my behalf. No. God took on the form of humanity in Jesus of Nazareth. He himself had this, he submitted himself to this. And it's all part of, of the, the payment of sin. It's ugly. It's brutal because sin is ugly. Sin is brutal. And that's what the whole sacrificial system was about. How sick is it that, that you know, a person would go and take a lamb and slit its throat and it would bleed out in front of you and you'd have to have your hand on its forehead and you'd feel it shimmer and shake and die. Why? The, and while the blood's being carried out, what's that all about? It's because as human beings, we learn to sin on credit. We sin and we don't die. So after that happens several times, we think sin doesn't have consequences. The sacrificial system taught, no, when you sin, death is required. And this lamb dies in your place. But the problem was, after centuries of this, it, it just, we became numb to it. And they only covered over our sin. It didn't take away our sin. And that's why Jesus came as the ultimate sacrifice the one sin for the one lamb, spotless lamb for all of humanity. Never again do we need to have sacrifices because God himself is the perfect lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And he rose from the dead because sin had no power over him. Death had no power over him. And his resurrection proved that he was who he claimed. And now he says, I offer you the gift. I will share in my resurrection power with you. It could be fragments, it could be entire documents, it could be pieces, um, it, it depends. It's, it's, it's a verified portions of scripture that we know are actual biblical portions, scripture portions, okay? I'm going to pray to conclude and uh, remind you next week, next week, why is there evil and suffering? If this God is so powerful that he can rise from the dead, then why does he let terrible things happen? Where is he when babies die? Where is he when wars are going on? What is up with suffering and evil? What kind of a loving God would do that, allow that? Where is God when all that happens? We're going to do our best to confront that head on next week. But let me pray right now as we conclude. Perhaps you're here right now, and you've just been investigating. I just want to give you an opportunity right now in this last moment to accept this gift of eternal life that God's offering and holding out to you. He rose from the dead not to show off, but to offer you a gift. So just pray this with me, perhaps, if you're ready to cross that line of faith. God, I acknowledge that you came, you lived, you died, and tonight... I'm prepared to acknowledge that you rose from the grave. And I accept your gift of forgiveness and eternal life. Now, I don't claim to understand it all. But what I do understand, I'm willing to act on. So show me your truth. Lead me in the, into the truth. 
but I want to give my life to you now as best I know how. By the authority of Jesus, I pray. Amen. God bless you. Thanks for being here tonight. Hope you join us next week. See you then.